mode. All right, hello everyone and welcome to V Brown Bag US. Uh, tonight we're discussing the Cisco DCICT Section 1 Part 1 uh, Data Center Fundamentals with Shane Walton. A couple show notes before we get started. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at V Brown Bag or at V Brown Bag Latam or at V Brown Bag EMEA, depending on where in the world you're located. And of course, the Twitter hashtag, hashtag V Brown Bag, if you want to ask questions during the broadcast or, you know, anytime really. Um, there are V Brown Bags around the world, so you can catch us in the APAC region every other Thursday at 10 p.m. NZDT. In EMEA, um, you can catch us Tuesdays at 7 p.m. BST. Latin America, Thursdays, 7 p.m. PDT. And, of course, the U.S., Wednesdays, 7.30 p.m. Central. So, again, uh, Shane, you are our host. I'm Lauren Malhoy. And, Shane, I'll let you take it away from here. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. Let's see if I get my screen set for you. All right. Do you see the first slide? Yep, looks good. Awesome, great. So this is the CCNA data center course. It's the based on the introducing Cisco data center technologies. Uh, my name is Sean Walton. I'm a data center solutions engineer, and today we're going to go over part one of this exam. The agenda is laid out with the 64916 introducing introducing da Cisco data center technologies. It's uh, going over the book a little bit. The describe the network architectures for the data center, including the LAN and SAN. Uh, describe the modular approach and network design, describing the data center core layer, the data center aggregation layer, the data center access layer, and if we have time, we'll be dig digging into some of the Nexus product family, not in its entirety, but at least in part of it, as well as the MDS product family. And then we'll have some questions if you want. Feel free to ask questions during the, thing, during the uh, presentation. I am a first-time presenter, so I will admit to you that I am very nervous at this, and hopefully we'll get through it together. And I appreciate your, your time and your, your patience. Okay. Introducing Cisco Data Center Technologies. Most of the information in this course or in the test for the second, it's the second test of the two, the two test series that will get you your Cisco Data Center CCNA uh, will come from the official CERT guides. And this is the book where I derive most of the information and slides for, for, for today. Uh, it is the CCNA Data Center DCICT 64916 official CERT guide. It is in its third printing as of September 2015. These are the ISBNs if you want to make sure that you get the actual uh, edition so you don't get an earlier one by accident and it can be purchased individually or as I did as part of the official certification guide library. It's uh, actually got some very good stuff and while the blueprint has a wide berth as far as where they can drive information from, this book actually has a majority of it if not all of it so it should keep you in uh, getting getting that test out of the way without too much of an issue. So the Introducing Cisco Data Center Technologies course is comprised of, of six distinct areas. The first one, section is for 30% of the test. It's the Cisco Data Center, data center Fundamentals Concepts. Uh, that is what we're going to go over part one today, and that's where I'm going to take you through the agenda we, we just spoke about. Uh, next week, it's going to get a lot more interesting. We're going to actually de delve into Fabric Path, uh, port channels, virtual port channels, virtual device context, and there'll be a lot more interaction. There'll be a lot more demo, and uh, hopefully I'll get a rack uh, set aside so that we can go in and do some interactive configuration steps with some of the Nexus products. So uh, while today is more of a death by PowerPoint presentation, I'm hoping that next week's going to be a lot more interesting for you. Uh, then on the 30th, we'll have the Data Center Unified Fabric, which is worth 20% of your exam. Uh, we're going to describe FCOE and FCOE multi-hop and some of the more converged implementations. Uh, we're going to describe virtual interfaces and the fabric extenders, as well as doing a, uh, a hopefully a, an initial setup if I can find a device, so if otherwise we'll simulate it. Uh, then somebody will also be taking over storage networking, which is worth 18% of the exam, a data center virtualization, which is worth 14% of the exam, and then unified computing, which is worth 17% of the exam. exam. The last device, the last slice, is very, very small. It's worth 1%, and it's data center network services, so it's going to dig into some of your, your, your 
WAS or your load balancers and such. Uh, this slide and more information on this can come from the uh, the learning content at Cisco at the link that's in the in the slide here. And now we can get started. So we're going to describe network architectures for the data center. And this is going to be covering both from a LAN perspective as well as a SAN perspective a little bit. There's going to be an actual SAN presentation coming up, so it's not going to be terribly deep into SAN, uh, but it'll be enough into the design to, for you to get the idea of exactly where where you're going and what you're think, what you need to think about when you're picking the right devices for the role that you want them to play within your storage infrastructure. The first model is the traditional three-tier network design. It's the one that you've all seen. It's the one that we grew up with. Uh, it has three distinct layers. It's got the core layer where we usually find the high-speed switching. It has a distribution layer where we do policy-driven dr dr services. And the access layer, which is usually where you're going to be connecting all your end devices or your servers. So if you're looking at the three-tier design here with the core layer and, and the two switch blocks, uh, this side could be your user space and you'd have just regular users with their workstations connected to these access layer switches. Uh, and then you can have servers. Maybe this is your, your traditional server farm and canvas environment on the right-hand side, and there are servers connected here. So the traffic flow would go from the access layer switch, which was usually going to be layer two up to the distribution layer, where it will segment layer two to layer three to go through the core layer switch, because the core layer is going to try to do the fastest switching possible, and you're also trying to isolate fault domains. So you, they're doing layer two and layer three separation traditionally. Oh, sorry. Layer two and layer three separation is going to be traditionally done at the distribution layer, but there are models where you can do layer three all the way down to the access layer. Uh, in the server farm perspective, that doesn't really do very well for you from a virtualization standpoint because you're trying to have those mobile workloads and you need to have your servers and your virtual servers be able to, to, to be motion from one switch to another or from one pod to another. So usually your layer two is going to be at the distribution layer traditionally, but there are other models that it supports that. Uh, one of the things that this this does for you is it gives you the spanning tree protocol is going to be reduced. It's not going to be able to affect the entire network. Uh, you're decreasing your failure domains because if you have a failure in one layer two element, it's not going to go up through the core layer and then affect your server farm. And that is the, traditionally from a campus perspective and usually in a lot of earlier data centers, this is the model that you will see for the most part. And then we have the collapsed core design. The collapsed core design, I will say, is mainly going to be for small to medium-sized businesses. Uh, it's usually going to be from a cost perspective. I'm sure that somewhere a CFO invented this model because in best practices and from a scalability perspective, uh, you're always going to want to have that third tier because if you can imagine taking a look at the collapsed core design where the collapsed core is down in the distribution layer, so now you have these, this layer doing both those functions. So not only is it trying to do the high speed switching and is also trying to do the, the aggregation services to your access layers down, down to the south side, uh, it also is trying to do the layer three switching between the two. And that's fine if you only have a single switch block or if you have two switch blocks. But imagine if you start growing to three or four or five. Uh, generally, this option is going to be based on cost. But when you're designing your network from the beginning, you're going to want to make sure that if you expect to grow, you're going to want, beyond the two switch blocks, you're going to want to make sure you have a core layer separate from everything else because uh, it's going to make scalability, especially scaling out, very, very easy and more cost effective, especially when you start pricing the, the outside plant. If you're doing it between buildings, you're going to end up having you know, multiple outside plant links for every single one, and it gets exponentially larger every time you add another another switch block to connect them all together for redundancy. So best practice is going to be the three-tier design in the campus, uh, but not necessarily uh, in the data center, in modern data centers. In modern data centers, you're going to usually see the spine leaf design. So most large scale data centers are using this design. They only have the two layers. The spine is designed to provide fast connectivity to all the leaves. And it allows for dramatic expansion outward. You can increase this capacity for bandwidth by adding spine switches. And when you add a spine switch, all the leaves will then connect to that new spine switch to increase the amount of bandwidth that you can have going between east and west. You also, the leaves, if you need to add more core density, you just add another block of leaves to the, to the spine. 
and that's how you add capacity from a network standpoint, whether you're doing it from a bandwidth or you're doing it from a port density, span, port density on the access layer. Uh, the spine and leaf design is also perfectly able to be mixed traditionally with uh, a sort of like a hybrid. It can be mixed with traditional multi-layer data center design. You can have a scalable access layer using spine and leaf architecture while keeping your other layers of the data center intact. So if you're trying to migrate to the new the spine and leaf design, uh, you can build it onto an existing traditional data center three core network and three layer network and have it interact just, just fine. The benefits of the spine and leaf design lead themselves mostly in the fabric path and ACI, applications centric infrastructure. With the fabric path, you're actually going to be using all of the links at the same time. You'd be not, you won't be using spanning trees. So when you have your multiple links between the leaves, instead of having one network link that's on while the other link's blocking, uh, fabric path will get rid of that, and it'll actually use all links at the same time. So you'll uh, not have to worry about the spanning tree aspect. You'll have full access to all of your bandwidth, uh, and there's going to be a lot of other tidbits of information that the fabric path is going to show you how you can have workload mobility across all of your fabric from one side to another regardless of how large your fabric is as long as it's interconnected with in the spine leak design. You know, and we're going to talk more about the layers as we, as we as we go more into the modular data center talk. So I wanted to make sure you had a sample question. So when you're talking about all the different questions that people can come up with in terms of you know, whether it's uh, something specific to the information on a, a data sheet or if it's uh, something that's just out of the book. Uh, there are several questions throughout this exam or throughout this presentation to give you an idea of what type of questions you might find when you, when you actually take the exam. So an example qu question for the data center architecture is, what is a collapsed core data center network design? So the answer is either A, in a collapsed core design, access layer, distribution layer, and core layers are collapsed. B, we collapse the core. The collapsed core is a design where only one core switch is used. C, in a collapsed core design, distribution and core layers are collapsed. And D, collapsed core design is a non-redundant design. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to come up with the answer on your, on your own. So the answer is C. We, we're in a class core design. We're collapsing the core down into the distribution layer, and we're melding those functions. So we're doing the high-speed switching as well as the policy-based services and aggregation of the access layer into the same device. And that is what a collapsed core network design is. In a SAN design, it's very much like the network design. You have servers, and you have and you have an initiate with your, your initiator, and they have to get to their target, which is the storage array. And traditional servers are going to have built-in storage, and and they'll connect to the network, and they'll they'll feed themselves with their information inside their own box, and they have direct connections. And it's a storage area network that storage is abstracted, and that's it's pulled into a single pool of disks, whether it's a JBOD or it's a storage array from EMC. And all of the servers then have to have the ability to access it. Uh, the way they've done that traditionally is they've, you know, from, it's both through fiber channel. Uh, in fiber channel, you have uh, multiple fabrics for redundancy. Uh, each of the storage controllers are redundant, which they connect to each of the fabrics independently. Uh, you have host bus adapters, which are on the initiators or the servers that connect to a fabric A or B independently of each other. So you have full autonomy and redundancy throughout the entire fabric. And the fabrics are in this case are completely separate. They don't they don't interconnect anywhere like a traditional network does. And when you're thinking about the different design aspects of it, you're gonna think you're gonna have to look at just like within the network, you're gonna be looking at what are the port density and topology requirements? You know, how many ports are you are you gonna need now and in the future? Are you gonna have a whole bunch of servers and they're all gonna have dual HPAs or multiple HPAs or, or if you're gonna have virtual HPAs and some sort of FCOE with UCS, uh, you're gonna to have to decide how many actual ports that you need to, to connect them together and keeping a look at a deal on your performance and over subscription ratios. In storage network design, you have what they call a fan out. How many servers are going to be connected to that port? Uh, and generally, the sweet spot is somewhere between seven and 15 servers per port. 
and the vendors will have more information on exactly from their perspective what it should be for their individual devices. The traffic manage whether you're going to do pressure over routing or, or, or resource allocation. Uh, fault isolation is consolidation, consolidation while maintaining isolations is where you can collect as much as you can and, and converge networking, but you're keeping it separate with fault isolated. So if you have an isolation a problem with Fabric B, uh, you still have Fabric A. Multi-pathing and redundancy. So the, when you have the servers, they have the multiple HPAs connected to each fabric. Uh, they can work with either active-active connections or active-passive connections to the, to the lungs. Uh, they're mapped using different controllers through zoning on the on the on the MDS devices or the Nexus devices if you're using a Nexus device for zoning. Uh, you can also have multi-pathing software that is, that monitors the active I/O path and leaves a second path in standover mode for failover. SAN switches use Fabric Shortest Path first routing protocol to first new routes through the network following a change to the network configuration, whether it's a link failure or a link or a switch failure. So in a more robust design, you might actually have uh, some multi MDS directors, multi-layer directors. At the top, you could have top of rack MDSs connecting to all of your servers, and they could be integrated into a, a network design much like a, a LAN network and they use FSPF to calculate the most optimal route between the targets and the initiators and come up with a backup path so that if uh, one of the links change or a route has an issue they can go through and, and immediately converge to the fastest the, the fastest backup route. Fiber channel standard defines three different topologies. So you can have a fabric, you can have an arbitrated loop, and you can have point to point. So looking at the figure, you have the, the point to point is basically two devices that are connected directly to another at any any one. So they can at any one time. Arbitrated loop is the devices are connected in a unidirectional loop, and only two devices can exchange information at any given time. Uh, while the hub down here looks like it's a, a a star topology physically, it's actually a arbitrated loop logically. And then you have the fiber channel fabric. A fabric requires one or more fiber channel switches connected together to form a control center between the end devices. And the standard permits connection of one or more arbitrated loops to the fabric. So you can have a fabric and then you can connect arbitrated loops to the fabric so that you can get end-to-end -end connectivity even with older, older storage. Which of the following options should be taken into consideration during SAN design? A, port density and topology requirements, device performance and over subscription ratios, traffic management, and low latency. The answer is A, B, and C. The, follow, the key principles of SAN design are port density and topology requirements or the number of ports required now and in the future. Uh, device performance and over subscription ratios, a determination of what is acceptable and what is unavoidable, and what your fan out, what your fan outs might be, how how, how that is going to affect your your storage I/O, and then traffic management, you know, routing and resource allocation. So when you're, divide, when you're designing a data center using a modular approach, the network is going to be divided into three functional layers. The core layer, which we've spoken about, which provides the high-speed switching. The aggregation layer, which is policy-based connectivity. The access layer, which is server connectivity. The access layer is going to grant user access to the network devices. It's going to provide connectivity to the servers. It's where you're going to apply your QoS, and it's where you will most likely implement top of rack or end of row topology. And at top of rack, you're going to be putting your access servers at the top of every rack, and so each rack becomes its own individual access pod. Uh, at end of row, you can put like a, maybe a very large port, dense, 
uh, switch at the very end of the row and flood cabling towards it for all your access. At the aggregation layer, it's also known as the distribution layer, and it's where you aggregate all your wiring closets or all your, your top of rack switch, switching. It segments the work groups, it provides poly based connectivity, and it provides connectivity service for your base ser network based services. So, uh, in order to not have to have services especially in, strewn out throughout your network, uh, the aggregation layer is where you're normally going to have your load balancers, your firewalls, because uh, that is where all of your network connectivity comes through from your access layer to the network on north to south connections. Then the core layer is the backbone. It provides high speed packet switching, scalability. It's always going to be deployed as highly available and it has to be fast it has to converge fast and that's usually why it's going to be a layer three connection. Or a layer three device, I'm sorry. Modular networks are divided into building blocks based on features and behaviors. Uh, simplify, it simplifies addressing within the data center. It provides isolation between modules, which determine pathing from block to block. That provides easy control of traffic flow and, and improves security. Uh, modular networks are elastic, so they allow for considerable growth or reduction in size depending on the, without it doing a bunch of changes or, or redesigns to the network. You can remove blocks without redesigning the entire network. You can add blocks without redesigning the entire network. It's designed to basically bolt on functionality. If you want to put in a, a, a WAN leaf block, you can add another couple of switches that are going to do all of your WAN connectivity and, and provide access to them. If you're going to provide a server access block, you can put another block in. You could have put 100 server access blocks in if you want. And whether you take blocks away or you add blocks, it doesn't take away from the overall design. You don't have to re go back to the drawing board every time you want to add a service or reduce the size or increase the capacity. What are the benefits of modular approach and network design? Scalability, high availability, security, and simplicity. This is a sample question from the book, and it's one of the ones that I have a little bit of umbrage with, and it's one of the things that you have to look out for when you're actually taking the exam. Uh, the answer is actually A, B, and, and D. Uh, they skip. They, they left C out. It's the least right answer because it doesn't. While the net modular approach doesn't directly provide security, uh, it makes it easier for you to control the traffic flow, which makes it inherently more secure. Which is what they say in the book, and it's what they say in the material. Uh, but it is one of the wrong answers if you were to select C. Those questions are the worst. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to get into each of the layers a little bit more in depth. This is the data center core layer. It's called out by the circle. Uh, when you're designing for a data center core layer, you're looking for what are your requirements? Do you need 40 and 100 gigabit Ethernet density? Uh, are you going to be using just 10 gig? Do you need 10 gig now, but 40 and 100 gig in the future? Uh, what are your administrative domains and policy going to be? And, and what is your future development going to be? So implementing the data center core is a best practice for large data centers because it's going to provide the ease of network expansion and it's going to avoid disruption to the data center environment when you're making those changes. When you're, you know, if you have requirements for 40 and 100 gig density now or in the future, you're going to probably end up in a Cisco Nexus 9000 or a Nexus 7000 series switch because it can support much higher densities at much higher bandwidth. Uh, if you don't need a data center core, or you're going to be starting small and you need only 10 gigabit data center density or you know that you're in the, in the core, you're going to have to decide whether or not you can you have enough 10 gigabit Ethernet ports on the campus core switch to be able to support both the campus distribution and the data center aggregation module or you're going to, if you're going to buy a smaller switch and start with what would traditionally be a, a, a leaf switch to provide all of your connectivity until such a time that you you grow enough to be able to grow into a modular switch or need the extra density. Uh, separate cores help isolate campus distribution layers or data center aggregation layers for troubleshooting. Uh, usually you're going to have your campus core is going to connect down into your data center core uh, for, for north-south traffic so users can access the data center services. 
Uh, the data center core is also going to give you uh, maximum speed and flexibility for migrating from from pod to pod and it's fine leaf design to say the data center core is all about moving east west uh, it also provides north south uh, but the bulk of your data center traffic is going to be east west it's going to be your beam motions it's going to be your, your storage if you're using IP storage across the network it's going to be you know uh, data center, websites, SQL databases, transactional databases that might be t talking back and forth. Uh, the old rule where 80% of your traffic was north-south is no longer true. Uh, in, in today's data center environments, a lot of the traffic is becoming east-west. And then anticipation of future development. I mean, the end, if you, when, if you don't do a data center core now, uh, you might find yourself uh, actually doing some redesigning when you start inserting it later. So in some cases, if you know that you have future development, uh, you might want to talk to your CFO or whoever holds the purse strings and, and tell them that you know it's going to save the money in the long run if they plan for the future and provide you with the proper gear that you need to do the best practice design and implement a core layer if you think you're going to need to go to it later. All right, key core layer characteristics. Uh, it's definitely certainly going to be connected to the to campus core using layer three links. Uh, data center network is normally going to be summarized and the core will inject the default route to the data center network. Uh, so that'll keep from a layer three perspective, it'll allow uh, as few routing changes as possible. So users on a campus and networks on a campus as they as they flap or, or they go down for a power outage or for maintenance or, or whatever, usually that's going to be isolated from a layer three perspective from, from the core layer of the data center. Data center switches are going to, core layers are going to have distributed forwarding arch architecture, low latency switching. Uh, they'll definitely have 10 gigabit Ethernet scalability, although in the in, in modern day, they're probably going to be looking more at 40 and 100 with the prices that the way they've been. Uh, it's going to provide scalable IP multicast support, which is going to help provide um, you know services, whether it's going to be uh, VXLAN services if you're doing multicast or versus unicast. Uh, and they're going to be deployed in pairs for high availability. From the data center core layer sample question perspective, which one of the following are key characteristics of the data center core layer? They'll provide connectivity to the aggregation layer, they'll provide connectivity to servers, a high availability, or they're used to enforce network connectivity. I'm sorry, network security. The answers are A and C. The data center core layer provides connectivity to the aggregation layer devices because it's a critical component of the data center where all the traffic from the aggregation to another, another aggregation versus the core layer, it's always going to be deployed in high availability mode. If you're not deploying cores in high availability, you're probably going to be, uh, you're going to have a few bad days. Describe the data center aggregation layer. The, the aggregation layer, sometimes known as the distribution layer, aggregates the uplinks from the access layer to the data center core. Uh, this is a critical point for control and application services, like security and application service devices, whether it's a load balancer, uh, SSL offloading devices, firewalls, IPSs. Uh, those will usually be deployed as a module in the aggregation layer. And by doing that as a module in the aggregation layer, it's going to lower your total cost of ownership and it's going to reduce complexity because you're not going to have uh, multiple components to service each of your each of your your different different layers. It's all going to come through the aggregation layer. And since all the data from the users collect there, or all the data going to the servers go through the aggregation layer, it's the perfect place to insert services. Um, it's going it's basically used to control application server, control access to application servers, let's fix that bullet, reduces the total cost of ownership and complexity. Uh, it's usually going to be high in 10 gigabit Ethernet density, especially southbound to the access layer switches. Again, uh, in modern net architectures, especially in spine leaf designs with Cisco Nexus 9000s, uh, a lot of those connections from the core layer to the distribution layer are going to also include uh, some 40 gig uplinks, maybe even 100 uplinks. And it's going to limit the number of components that you have to configure and manage. And here is a sample question for the ACT. 
which of the following statements about the data center aggregation layer is correct, and please forgive the title, I copied the slide and forgot to change it. The purpose of the aggregation layer is to provide high-speed packet forwarding. It provides policy-based connectivity. It provides connectivity to the network-based services, such as a load balancer and firewall. Indeed, this layer is an optional layer in the data center design. Hopefully you got that correct. The answer is B and C. The data center aggregation layer provides policy-based network connectivity and connectivity to the network-based services. The data center access layer. The data center access layer is the first point of entry to network for your servers and other edge devices, whether it's users or it's your servers, depending on whether it's a data center or a campus network. The switches on the access layer are usually going to be connected to two separate distribution layer switches for redundancy. Uh, a lot of times, especially in the server environment, uh, you'll have uh, a top of rack scenario where you have two access layer switches so that you can have multiple NICs connecting to two different switches for physical redundancy down to your NICs. The data center access layer usually provides layer two. It can provide layer two, it can provide layer three connectivity. Uh, in modern data center act designs, it's currently usually doing layer two down to the servers and mostly layer two to the distribution layer uh, with VXLAN and other extensible overlays uh, layer three to from the access to the distribution layer is becoming more common, uh, but it's not pre prevalent yet, I don't think. One of the things about the access layer and, and, and layer two elasticity is that, especially with your virtual servers, the VLAN needs to be extended across all the access switches using trunk ports so that the VLAN can have this in the same, can, can support the same IP address allocation and the same broadcast domain across multiple pods. And, whether it's the entirety of the of the fabric and it goes through the entire data center, or whether you've got that got it scaled down into individual data data center pods that do specific functions, uh, that VLAN connectivity has to be there. And also, if you want to move workloads, that VLAN is usually going to be uh, tied to, say, your vMotion network, which needs to be able to access all of your ESXi hosts in order to uh, move those workloads from from host to host, so you can do the maintenance that you need to do. The um, they're typically always going to be layer two for server. When extending layer two to the aggregation layer, physical loops must be managed with spanning tree protocol. So the spanning tree protocol <clears throat> and rapid spanning tree protocol is recommended uh, to ensure a loop-free topology over the physical topology. Uh, in modern networks, in data center networking, uh, spanning tree is becoming less and less prevalent. Uh, it's more the, the technologies now where you have your virtual port channels, regular port channels, so your multi-chassis port channels. A virtual port channel basically takes two switches and ties them together in a single control plane through their VPC peer link, which allows them to provide two switches that will have multiple links connected to another device. And even though they're in two separate switches, they're in the same virtual dom the VPC domain, and it can provide a LACB port channel that looks like it's coming from a single entity. Uh, it's a lot like uh, traditional campus stacks where they're stacked together with stacking cables in the back and they, they have they, they use uh, one control plane so you can actually have multiple switches before participating in the same LACP bundle. So a mix of both layer two and layer three access models permits a flexible solution and enables the application environment to be optim optimally positioned. Basically what that means is uh, having layer two and layer three is going to reduce your fault domain to, to the smallest level it can possibly be while still allowing you the flexibility of having VLAN mobility from pod to pod. And where will you connect a server in a data center? And this is an actual sample test question that's widely available. It's actually in the book. So take it for what it's worth. It's actually right after the data center access layer section. Where will you connect a server in the data center? The access layer, the aggregation layer, the core layer, or the services layer? And you're all right. I'm sure the access layer is the answer. It provides connectivity to servers and other edge devices. All right, so now that you have sort of a base understanding of, of the topologies and, and how they they inter interact and together, you start to have to take a look at the different product families that are available because at some point when you start designing, you're going to need to 
uh, be able to pick the appropriate device to perform the appropriate role based on your requirements. And so we're going to start by looking at the Cisco Nexus product family for the LAN side. The Nexus product family is a key component in the unified data center architecture. It's uh, designed to provide unifying fabric. And it's designed to be highly available, highly secure network fabric. Um, you can build end-to-end -end data center on three-tier architecture or spine-leaf architecture with them. Uh, they offer high density 10 gig, 40 gig, and 100 gig ports as well. When you're looking at all these different devices, uh, there's a lot to choose from. And there's a lot of options, so it, it can get confusing. When you're going through the, the exam, uh, you're going to be expected to know a lot about products. So while this is going to sound a lot like marketing versus technical, uh, some of the things that you're going to need to know are going to be about product numbers, uh, capabilities, line cards, uh, capacity, you know, you name it. So we're going to go through a lot of that just for the Cisco Nexus 9000 family for now. Uh, when we get to the next week, we'll probably do our configuring and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the 7Ks, uh, this family here, because that's what we'll have access to for uh, doing some career aims, maybe some 5,000s, and possibly some fixes, so my, assuming I get my rack. So Unified Fabric and, and Nexus Design is designed entirely to use the, the bandwidth as effective as it possibly, and it's going to be trying to use multiple links that, that exist between the source and destination as a single path as active, rather than having them being blocked by a spanning tree or have it, they don't want it to be limited to active standby NIC teaming. They want to have active active as much as possible. Uh, using layer two multipathing, such as fabric path and virtual port channels, they can actually provide 100% uh, link use uh, across the entire fabric without any spanning tree. They help facilitate the optimizing computing resources. They deal with CPU and memory as resources that are utilized when needed. Uh, you can move workloads from one side of the fabric to the other with the virtualization in UCS. And with the higher density platforms, you can reduce the number of compute nodes in the data center. Uh, service profiles and booting from SAN allows the UCS system to reduce the time to instantiate new servers. Uh, so now when you're doing your build and your teardown and test and development environments, rather than having to go work with a physical server or even stand up a virtual server and have to worry about where where it's getting its resources from. Uh, the UCS system and the 5100s uh, abstract, I'm sorry, UCS manager abstracts the entire hardware from, from, from the system and provides workload mobility by assigning hardware abstraction and being able to move that, that service profile from one piece of hardware to another. Uh, some of the other issues that the Nexus Family Switch aims to fix are the power and cooling problems in the data center. Uh, they're using unified, you're doing that by doing unified fabric where you have converged SAN and LAN with SAN and LAN with fabric channel over Ethernet, virtual Cisco virtual interface cards using VMFX and AdapterFX, uh, and with the higher port bandwidth links. Uh, so rather than using eight 10 gig links, you can use two 40 gig links. So using that less Using fewer cables provides more efficient airflow and it lowers your cooling requirement. Um, it has a much improved reliability during software updates with ISSU. You can do in-service in software updates. Uh, depending on the, the code level you're on, you can go from one code level to another without any, in, with any, any pause in service with nonstop forwarding from one, from one soup to the other. And using the, the unified fabric, you can your host can, especially virtual hosts, can move without needing to change the topology or, or require any kind of address change. So we're going to start with the Cisco, so Cisco Nexus 9500 chassis based switches, and this is sort of a death by eye chart, but you're actually going to have to go through and memorize all the charts that are in the book. Uh, they're all going to be labeled as key topics. 
Uh, they're all going to be testable. So when, you, when you're when you looking at something like the Cisco Nexus chassis base, which is one of the easier way to remember it, remember is while they are different, the 9504 is a four-slot four switch, the 9508 is an eight-slot switch, the 9516 is a 16-slot switch, which uh, that's fairly linear in terms of how it, you know, multiplied it, how it goes. It's 4, 8, 16, so it's by 2. Most of the stats are going to be the same, except for the ones where they're different based on the number of slots that they have. So they all have two supervisor slots. That's not going to change. They all have six fabric modules. But their I.O. module slots where their line cards are going to go up. So it's 4, 8, and 16. Each of the slots are going to be 3.84 terabits per second. But then you get into the maximum bandwidth, which is going to multiply again. So that's going to be 15, 30, and 60. And the number of ports are also going to do the same multiplier. So when you're doing the memorization, you can remember one, but then the, the smallest one. But remember then the key elements that you have to multiply to get to the answer for the others. Uh, they all do front to back airflow in this, in this case. And they have either four, six, or 10 power supplies. And those power supplies are going to be 3,000 watt. Uh, PSUs. They all have fan trays, three fan trays, and their application is generally end of, end of row or core. Um, they have a modular architecture. They have they have a switch chassis. They have a supervisor engine, system controllers, fabric modules, line cards, power supplies, fan trays, and optics. Out of all those parts, the supervisor, system controllers, line cards, and power supplies are all common components that can be shared among any of the family in the 9500. Cisco 9500 chassis components are, are all pictured here, except for the system controllers, which are not separately pictured. They're here in the bottom of the chassis in the back. The, it's made up of the chassis. It has two supervisors, a system, system controllers, which are down in the bottom of the chassis in the back, the line cards, the power supplies, the fan trays, and here are the fabric modules. The fabric modules have the have the NFEs in them. So it doesn't have a mid-plane. If you, if you look at the switch, just the chassis in the front, you don't see anything in the back. There is no mid-plane. Mid-plane send block airflow, so it reduces the cooling efficiency. And since there isn't a, a mid-plane a mid to provide alignment, the fabric cards and the line cards actually align together. The fabric cards are behind the fan trays and they connect in here and then they have uh, slots that the line cards actually plug into inside the switch. The uh, supervisor engine right here is a, it supports two half width supervisor engines so they don't actually take up a line card slot like you find in like a Catalyst or a Nexus 7000 series. They have their own dedicated slot. So you have full use of all the slots advertised in the, in the box. Um, the supervisor engine is responsible for the control plane function. They support modules, manage all switch operations. The supervisor module A consists of a 1.8 gigahertz CPU, four cores, and 16 gig of RAM, upgradable 48 gig of RAM, and a 64 gigabit SSD for storage. That is no longer the only, the only the only supervisor available. There is a second supervisor available, which has a, a larger core, greater memory, and a 256 gig SSD. I'm not 100 percent sure if it, it's something that will be on the test, but it, it would be it would be fair game since it's part of the blueprint. It uses an external clock source, and it also and it has multiple ports for managing, including two USB ports, an RS-232 serial interface, which is your standard console port, and a 10 100 1000 megabits network port for management across the network or in an out-of-band network scenario. The system controller, there's a pair of redundant ones in the back. They offload chassis management functions for the supervisor modules. Uh, they're responsible for managing power supplies and fan trays, and they uh, host two main control and management paths, the Ethernet out-of-band channel and the Ethernet protocol channel between the supervisor engines, line cards, and fabric modules. The Ethernet out-of-band channel provides intra-system management communications across modules, and the Ethernet protocol channel handles the intra-system data plane control communications. This platform, regardless of which one it is, supports six fabric modules. 
Uh, the battery modules perform pack, packet lookup and forwarding functions, uh, as well as in conjunction with the line cards. In fact, both contain multiple network forwarding engines. Uh, the 9504, each fabric con connector has one network forwarding engine. The 9508 has two network forwarding engines per fabric controller, and the 9516 has four per fabric controller. So that is your multiplier again. There's one NFE, two FFE, NFEs, and four NFEs. So it's going to be a multiplier of two, regardless of how you look at it. The line cards are they're all types. We're going to look at a few of them individually and, and uh, talk about the different modes that they can be run in. But the difference, the main difference between the 9500 line cards is that they can be used in standalone mode, which is when they use NXOS or in a classical design, but there's also the application-centric infrastructure, which is a new HCI, or not so new anymore. Uh, there are line cards that are used in application-centric infrastructure mode only, uh, and there are also cards that can be started in NXOS and then be upgraded and be used in ACI as well. And those are another, this is another element that you're going to be expected to know, the difference between one card and another, what mode they can be used in, or if they can be used in both, or just a single one, not the other. Um, all the line cards have multiple NFEs for packet lookup and forwarding engines, um, which is a Trident T2. Uh, the ACI line cards contain an additional ASIC, ASIC called an Application Leaf Engine, which is short for ALE. And it performs the ACI Leaf function when the Nexus 9500 is used as a Leaf node and deployed in ACI mode. The power supplies, it supports up to 10, depending on the, on the chassis and they're accessible from the front and they're hot swappable. Two 3000 watt AC power supplies can operate a fully loaded chassis, but they also support N plus one and N plus N grid redundancy. Um, the power supplies are 80 plus platinum rated and provide more than 90% efficiency. Here's some examples of some 9500 line cards. So the line card specifications are gonna be a key topic on the exam. You're going to need to understand non-blocking versus over -solution. So when they do non-blocking, that basically means that the ASICs in the, in the line card uh, has enough capacity from a, from a bandwidth standpoint to have every port talking at full speed at once. Uh, over -solution. some of the cards are uh, minimal over -solution. They're going to be one and a half to one, uh, where they have uh, ASICs that can't quite keep up with everything to a one and a half to one ratio. Um, you're going to want to understand what type of transceivers are supported, whether it's going to be QSFPs for 40 gig or SFP pluses for 10 gig, which includes the twin, ax twin axes for shorter runs. Um, the biggest thing with the optics are going to be the QSFPs are going to be the bi dies. So the, bi the standard QSFP pluses use eight wires to talk to each other, each eight strands of fi fiber. Uh, Cisco has the MyDi QSFPs, which actually uh, consolidate that down so that you can use your existing 10 gig infrastructure. So if you're running a lot of your ON3 or ON4 cables with LC connectors, the MyDi 40 gig MyDi SFPs can take the two wire L LC connectors and run a full 40 gig across them. And then you're going to want to know which mode they support, whether they're standalone or ACI. Um, so as examples, the, 90, the 9636PQ, it's a non-blocking, it has 36 40 gig QSFP ports, it'll do layer 2 and layer 3 at line rate on all ports for all packets, and it supports a 4 by 10 gigabit breakout, breakout mode. Basically what that means is you can take a QSFP port and you can break it out into four individual 10 gig links if you'd like. Uh, this particular one cannot be upgraded to ACI mode. Then you have the 9564TX, which supports 100 megabit Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, and 10 base T copper cabling connectivity for server access. It does layer 2 and layer 3 line rate performance on all ports for all packet sizes. Uh, and this one's special because it does Cisco enhanced NXOS and ACI infrastructure mode. So if you have this one in your, in your chassis, it can be in standalone mode or ACI mode. You won't have to replace that one if you're moving from traditional NXOS and standalone mode to ACI. Then you have the 9736PQ, it's 36 port, 40 gig Ethernet, QSFP line card, it is also non-blocking. This one is only used in spy and switch role when used in ACI mode, and it works only in ACI mode. So 
there's several more line cards that are for the 9000 series and they all have varying connectivity ports, uh, number of ports, type of ports, and modes that they support, and also different ones that are either blocking or not blocking, or they have slight over subscription. And when you go through all of it, you're going to need to know each one of those things. It's, it's a lot of memorization in this part, so uh, I'd just say take your time, memorize the things that are all the same, and then sort of know what that is for everything and then just concentrate on the differences. Then we have the Cisco Nexus 9300 fixed and modular switches. These are usually going to be used for top of rack, middle of row deployments, uh, depending on whether they're, they're typically they're going to be leafs in your network. It's designed for top of rack and middle of rack deployments. The 40 gig ports on the Cisco Nexus are provided in an uplink module that can be serviced and replaced by the user. So every one of those, except for the 9336PQ, which is basically a ACI mode only spine switch, uh, so that's why it has the, the big density uh, 40 gig connections. The other ones have that module on top of them, and if you're and they can all be interacted. They have 12 ports each. Uh, the special thing about this to remember is that when you put it into a 93128TX, uh, it only supports eight. So if you look here under if you look here under the max number of ports, it's a 12 for 40, 12 for 40, and eight for 40 here. Well, oops, sorry. When you put that same 12 port module in this, it only activates the first eight ports. So I would expect that that's going to be a pretty good question on the test. I haven't seen it. I haven't taken the test in a long time, but it would be it would be something that would definitely be testable, and it would be something that they would probably do just to mess with you. The airflow, they not all of them support reversible airflow. The 9336PQ is front to back only. Uh, all the other switches in this particular segment are front to back or back to front. And again, if you look here at the oversubscription rate, three to one. So you can look at this, and you can see that this is 480 gigabits. So it's got 48 10 gig ports that correspond to the 48 480 gigabits. Same thing here, and it's considered non-blocking. But then you look here, and you see that this 128 port, the max number of ports here is for 96, and it's got a three to one oversubscription. So you can pretty much figure out that that's 320 gigabits per second for that switch, for the one to three ratio. Okay, I didn't use the question that I brought up as a sample because I figured that would be too easy for you. So the Cisco Nexus product family sample question is true or false, the Nexus 9, 9, N9K X973-6PQ can be used in standalone mode when the Nexus 9000 module switches uses NXOS. True or false? So the answer is false. The that is a ACI only line card, and regardless of whether you connect it to uh, other switches in the 9000 family that are on NXOS, it is only ever going to be an ACI line card as a first line. Now we get into a little bit into the NDS product family, real quick. So the NDS product family. In 2002, Cisco decided that they wanted to enter the storage network business, and they spun in a company called Andiamo Systems, which is in Italian, it means let go, and the MDS 9000 multi-layer switch family was born. It's composed of fabric and director class fiber channel switches, and those devices are capable of deploying highly available and scalable storage area networks, much like the fabrics in NXO, Nexus devices today. In fact, the SAN OS is the precursor of NXOS, and, and now modern day Cisco MDS boxes are also running NXOS. So there's a lot of parity there in terms of features and, and what they can do. It's also one of the reasons why a lot of Nexus devices have unified ports and can also do native fiber channel at the same time, and that's where you're starting to see uh, some of the hybrid deployments where you have FCOE to a point, and then you use your Nexus infrastructure to jump off into your storage, and you can zone directly on your Nexus devices rather than in putting in a, a completely separate MDS box for it. Uh, although a lot of people still like keeping them completely separate, so it's, it's, there's no wrong answer as far as how you're going to design it and where you're going to put it in your network. 
The MDS multi-layer directors, same thing. It's going to be the eye chart. You're going to be looking at, you know, what type of soups they have. The more modern ones are using supervisors. MDS 9700 supervisors. They do take up a slot. And the, as you start getting to the, the larger switches and the newer switches, they're all using fabric modules, just like the the Nexus devices. Uh, the older ones and the smaller ones from, that are older are you still using soups because they're more catalyst-like at, at that time. Uh, port density is still quite large. You've got 192, 384, 528. Then you've got the line rates at 16 gigabits per second and the 384 at 16 gigabits per second. So you don't really necessarily have to have a, a, a extended fabric. You can have two director classes that have enough port density to run all of your storage if you want. Uh, a lot of people do that for consistency, for, for for consistency and having a single point of, you know, point of management. But the uh, fabric services provide the same point of management, even if you're extending the fabric out across the network. Some of the other reasons to extend the fabric out is maybe you want to follow a typical top of rack design from a cabling perspective. If you're somebody's using structured cabling, where you might get into some of the multi-service and multi-layer fabric switches, you know, to do. Uh, sort of top of rack and do more of a three-tier or a two-tier network for your storage as well. Uh, let's see. The multi-service and multi-layer fabric switches are similar to the fixed density switches for the for the Nexus. Uh, they perform, they have all kinds of other services that they can do, whether they can do fiber channel over IP, uh, some of them can do FICON. They can they support something called vSANs. So while networking has VLANs, uh, Cisco provided the MDSs with the ability to virtual SANs. Uh, that provides uh, separation for your storage area networks across the same fabric, uh, much like VLANs do it for your servers today. And it's a oh, ah, sorry, it's a completely different administrative domain. The regards to what vSAN you're in. Uh, so one vSAN, regardless of what you do to it, is not going to affect the other. You can have completely different zone sets. Uh, so you can have servers in one vSAN connecting to storage in, in the same at vSAN, uh, completely different zone set active at the same time as a different vSAN has a, a storage zone active at the same time for a completely different subset. So if you're doing multi-tenant multi or you have uh, you know, different classifications of data, you can keep them separated within the same box. And by classifications, I mean data classifications, not government classifications. Those you can't have in the same box. Uh, then the Cisco MDS 9200s, 9100 series are FIPS compliant for federal government support, and they also support IPv6. Uh, there's a couple additional resources that I went through today to look at for you. Uh, the Cisco Design Zone for data centers, uh, it does not require a login to get to. Hopefully that's on your screen now. Um, you can go into all the FlexPod OpenStacks with the different converged infrastructure regards depending on what your your storage is. Uh, you get data center interconnecting, which is something we're going to be talking about next week. Uh, data center networking, we talked a little bit about this week, but we'll talk a little bit more in depth next week. Uh, architectures, this is also where you can find some of the Cisco validated designs for each of those technologies. And one of the other big things that you're going to want to, want to, want to look at is going to be NXOS licensing software features. Uh, one of the things with the NXOS is everything is, fe is a feature that you have to turn on. So if you want to support Telnet, you have to turn it on as a feature. If you want to support routing, there is a, there's, a fe there's an enterprise license for, there's a license for that. They're going to expect you to know what each of these are, and pretty good amount of what's in them. So I wanted to provide you that so that you could take a look at it. I think you saw it in one of your earlier podcasts, but it's good to revisit because it's uh, something that they hit, you know, relatively hard. And each of the product families has a completely different licensing scheme. Uh, a lot of them overlap, but they by names, but they and, and features, but 
some of them have some additional licenses that you want to take a look at and make sure that you know what the different licenses are. Also, keep an eye on how to look at licenses and how to apply licenses. Something we'll probably go through a little bit next week since I'll actually have my hands on an actual switch. Uh, I can show you how we look at the features that are in use, that are turned on, uh, and then the licensing that's associated with it and what the grace periods are. And that's all I have. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask the moderator. Feel free to email me. I will answer any question as promptly as possible. And I appreciate you allowing me to speak today. Wow, perfect timing on the dot. Thanks so much for uh, all of that. If you're, for being a first time uh, presenter, you didn't say ah oh, at all, I don't think. So that was pretty impressive. <laughs> oh, well, I can get it away now. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me just see if there are any questions. Um, no, it looks like we are good. So, yeah, I think that's it. Um, thanks again, and we'll see you next week and hopefully um, see all the listeners as well. So thanks again. Everyone have a good night. Great. Thank you. Have a great night.